morning. Thanks so much for being here today, everybody. Thank you for being with us on a, on a cold, windy day that's probably not going to get any better than it is right now. And so thanks for being here. I am glad you're here to worship with us. I hope that you're excited to be here. If you're a visitor and you're visiting with us for the first or second time, in your row of, of chairs there, you'll find a basket. And in that basket, there's a card that says connect with us. If you would fill that card out and bring it over to the kitchen, we have a gift for you as a way to say thank you for being here today. And so if you'll take the time to fill that out, we would appreciate it. I do have a few uh, announcements I want to let you know about. Uh, first of all, our Wednesday night Bible study, we've been going through the foundation study with Ken Ham. We will not meet the next two weeks. We will not meet this Wednesday or the first Wednesday of November. So we'll meet again on November the 10th. So no Wednesday night the next two weeks, and uh, sorry about that. That's just a uh, conflict and some things that have to get taken care of. So no Bible study the next two weeks. We'll meet again on November the, the 10th, and uh, that's Wednesday night. Also, our Wednesday night group has been talking, and anyone in the church is welcome to join us. But we're going uh, the 15th and 16th of November to the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. And so we're going to go up on one day, spend the night, come back on the next day. And so um, if you're interested in going on that, um, the sign-up sheet is almost full. Um, but we're going to have a meeting today in the parlor immediately after church, just a short meeting, so that I can nail folks down. We Today's the day. If you're going to go, today is the day day, and I will book hotel rooms after today. So if you want to go the 15th and 16th with us, um, that is, right now the price is $150, but it's actually going to go down from there. We have a couple things that are going to bring it down. I can give you a final cost once I have the hotel rooms booked. So um, we're going to meet today in the parlor after church. That's, t that's today. Um, also, today is the last day to sign up for um, the new members class. If you're interested in joining Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, we're having a new members luncheon. Uh, next Steps luncheon, we call it. Um, it's supposed to be next Sunday, and so if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet for that. And it's not a commitment. It's just to talk, learn, ask about Pleasant Hill. And so we're going to have lunch after church next Sunday, but you do need to be signed up so that I make sure I have enough food for everybody. So if you're interested in that, sign up. Today's the last day to sign up for that. Also, the last day for budget recommendation forms. They are also on the table back there. Everything I'm talking about is on the table back there. Um, budget recommendation forms, if you'll fill those out and turn them into the office today before you leave, because the Budget and Finance Committee is meeting today after church. And so um, that's everything that I have announcement-wise, I think. So now we can get to the business at hand, the business of worshiping the Lord and having church together. And so uh, we're going to begin today with a time of prayer. It's also a time in which you can give your tithes and offerings. If you'll just drop those in those baskets in your row of chairs there, someone after service comes around and gather those, gathers those up. And so you can give to that basket. You can give online through our app. You can also give online through tithe.ly. There's a scan to give there in that basket if you have any questions about that. Just scan that with your phone and it should take you right where you need to be. Um, and so we're going to have a time of giving as well as a time of preparing our hearts for worship today. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we could come together and we can worship. We thank you that we can give as you've blessed us, Lord. I pray that you would be with us today as we sing together, as we worship together, as we look to your word. I pray that everything that we say and do would be an act of worship to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We invite you to stand and sing praises to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. Thank you. 
to you today and we just ask that this prayer this song this praise that we sang to you that would this would be our life song god that your presence is welcome here lord we ask you to come in to fill our hearts to have our eyes and ears be open by the word that you have given to pastor jason lord and that not that we just hear it that we go out and be doers as well lord and that we take your scripture seriously in your name we pray So I have some things written down that I'm supposed to say now, but I feel like we need to take just a minute. And I think we have some people who are hurting today and that need some prayer. And so we're just going to take a minute. And so um, I'm not going to call anybody out, but if you're hurting and you need prayer, I just want you to stand up where you're at.
And if you don't, I will start calling people out. <laughs> Just to stay, stay where you're at. Stay standing. You don't get to sit down. Sorry. We're going to have people come to you, and they're going to pray for you right now. So go to these folks. Some of them you know, some of them you don't. Just go to them. We're going to pray for them right now. Lord, we have people in our midst, and they're hurting, and they worship through the hurt, and they worship through the heartache. Lord, I pray that you would provide them with peace and comfort today. It's not easy to stand up and say, I need prayer. But when we're in a body of believers like we are right now, that should be the easiest thing for us to do. For us to, to say to our brothers and sisters that we need you, Lord, is a confession that we all need to make every single day. Lord, we know that there are people that didn't stand today that need you, Lord, and that need your prayer, that need your comfort. I pray that you provide them with that peace and that comfort. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that it provides comfort. I pray that you wrap your arms around those that need it today. I pray that you do that with your spirit, that you do that with your body. Lord, I thank you for loving us, and I thank you for putting us in a place where we can do this. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And now I'm going to try and preach. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Today we're going to look at a miracle. That's just where I'm going with it. I'm going to skip some of the other stuff. We're going to look at a miracle. And we're going to look at a miracle that took place in the book of Acts. And many people, they ask why we don't see miracles today. And I think that we do. I think we do see miracles today. We just have to keep our eyes open to see them. In the book of Acts, we get to see not just the miracle itself, but the ripple effect that occurs from that miracle. You see, we don't oftentimes think about the ripple effect of our actions. How what we do affects someone else, that affects someone else, that affects someone else. But you see, God calls us to do things sometimes. And we may not understand why God asks us to do them. We may not understand why God asks us to go pray with someone or to go stand by someone or to go somewhere that you wouldn't normally go. But when God asks us to do those things, our obedience is the ripple that may lead to someone else's obedience that may lead to me being in the place I need to be so that God can do something that he needs to do in my life. Or maybe God needs to get me out of the way so that he can do something in the life of someone else. We don't think about those ripples. And you see, what we're going to have the opportunity to do over the next couple of weeks is that this week we're going to get to see the miracle, and then we're going to get to start to see the ripples and the effects of that miracle. Because this miracle happens over the, the course of a few verses— but we're going to hear about it for a couple of chapters in the book of Acts. Today we're going to look at how Peter and John's obedience to the Lord and the miracle that they saw had ripples, and we'll get to see those effects next week. We're going to start in Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful, so that he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for money. And Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, 
I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then, taking him by the right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him. He was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. So there's the miracle. Peter and John, they're on their way to the temple. For Jewish people, there were three parts to their faith. There was the scripture, there was worship, and there was alms, or showing kindness to others. So this man knew this. And so what he did is he stationed himself at the gate that people would walk through on their way to the temple, hoping that while they were on their way to worship, they would be in a more giving spirit, that they would give him silver, gold, whatever it was he asked for. You're on the way to temple. Surely you know that what you're supposed to do is give to those who are less fortunate, and I am just one of those people. So he's going to put himself in the right place to get the most benefit. So he's, he's camped out there at the gate, beautiful. And he was shocked when Peter and John came because he, he asks them for money, and they look at him. But what do they say? They say, I don't have silver or gold. Okay, then keep moving on, right? Because that's what I'm here for. I'm here for silver and gold, so if you don't have that, then why are you wasting time? Because the crowd is moving on, and if you're occupying my time, then I'm not getting any of the money that I need, right? So what, he, what they do is they look at him. Now, he asks them for money. Scripture says this. He asked for money. Money is often the answer for us, isn't it? We think if I could just get more money, if I could just have more, if I could just make a little more. My, my dad once told me that all growing up and when, he was, when they were raising the kids, they would think, if I could just make $1,000 more a year, that's all we need then you'd make the $1,000 more a year, and you'd think, if I could just make $5,000 more this year, that'd be it, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be great? We'd have all we could ever ask for. Well, if I could just make just a little bit more. Nobody ever says, you know what? This year, I made just the right amount of money. Right? Money's always the answer. If there's a problem, we should just throw more money at it right? If you've got a problem, throw more money at it. Well, that'll take care of it. Just give it more money. That's the answer. And that's what this man thought. He was there to get money. So he asked for money, but they said they didn't have any. But you see, John and Peter, they were there to give him something greater than money. Instead of giving him what he wanted, they gave him what he needed. And so often we ask for things that we want and we neglect the things that we need. And that's where this man finds himself. Do you see the difference between those two? He wanted money. He would have been happy with money. But they said, we don't have that. Instead, we're going to give you what you need. But then we see something amazing happen in the name of Jesus. And that's important. We'll see that in a minute. We see this man, lame from birth, get up and walk. Now, there, we think of this as one miracle, but there are so many miracles packed in right here if we think about it. Scripture says clearly that his feet and his ankles became strong. If he were lame from birth, I don't know if you ever had the opportunity to encounter someone who was a beggar, who has been lame from birth. Having lived in a third world country, I've encountered this. The legs of this person would be shriveled, thin, no, muscula no musculature, I don't even know if I said that word right, 
no muscles, no strength, nothing. If you've ever broken your arm and you've had to put it in a cast, I'm not calling anybody out today. I'm not about that. If you've ever had that, you have to go to people for therapy because even if your arm is just cast for just a short little bit, it becomes weaker. We have profession, medical professionals in our church that that's their job, is to help people who recover from an illness who's caused, that's caused them to become weak, or that they have to recover their, the use of their limbs from having them in casts and things like that. And you have to learn to do everything all over again. When someone's in the hospital, even just for a few weeks, they have to go through rehabilitation to be able to walk again. Because when you lose that muscle usage, you can't just jump up out of bed and walk, right? This man has been lame from birth. He has never used his legs. Remember, babies don't come out walking. And so this man has never used his legs, and suddenly his, his ankles and his feet, they become strong. The miracle is spreading through his body. He is growing muscles. He has to grow muscles there in that moment. The tendons have to connect. Everything has to just work. Not only that miracle, but there's also the miracle of teaching him in his mind suddenly how to walk. Because this man doesn't just get up and walk. No, look at what Scripture says. He jumped up and he started to walk. And then he was walking and leaping and praising God. And I've seen you guys, some of you only know how to do one of those right? If I asked you guys to leap today, several of you would have to go to those medical professionals to have that rehabilitation done, right? But walking and leaping and praising God, how many miracles do we see in order for this to happen? Not just one. This is miracle upon miracle upon miracle all at once. And you know what? The people took notice, didn't they? He had been there for a while, and the people took notice of what was going on. But here's the thing. How many of us are like John and Peter? And we're on our way somewhere. And we see a need that be, needs to be addressed but we don't stop to address the need. Maybe we're distracted by the beautiful gate. The gate is called beautiful. I have never seen the beautiful gate, but I imagine it was something to behold. You don't call something the beautiful gate if it's not, right? So maybe you're distracted by the beauty of all that's around you. Or maybe you're distracted by the fact that it's 3 o'clock and it's time for you to be at temple. You've got places to go. You have things that you're supposed to be doing. You know you don't have silver and gold in your pocket, so why should you stop and give this man what he wants? Because it's not about addressing what he wants. It's about addressing what he needs. I want to share a story with you that's one of one of the most painful church experiences I've ever had. I grew up attending a church near my house. By near my house, it was across the road from my house. Okay? And so we walked to church every morning. That wasn't a feat. It was literally across our front yard. We walked across the yard to church every Sunday morning. Before I was 10 years old, my dad was transitioning from being a pig farmer to being a policeman. And so he was at the Illinois State Police Academy. But when you're at the Illinois State Police Academy, you're not getting paid like you're a policeman. So you still gotta farm the pigs. Or your mom and two young boys do. 
And I didn't realize how bad this was when I was a kid. But as I think back on this, it was bad. Because there was a Sunday morning, and the pigs got out. And I don't know if you've ever farmed pigs or not, but that's a big deal. And it's a mess, and it is hard to get them corralled, and if you're in your Sunday dress, and your kids are nine and seven, and you're chasing them across the yard, it's a nightmare. But that nightmare gets worse when the church people arrive and walk into church and leave you to chase the pigs. Because you see, they were distracted by the beautiful gate. And they were distracted by the fact that it was time to start Sunday school. And they didn't see the need of my mom and her two kids chasing pigs around a yard. And that, my friends, is how you lose people. That's how you lose people. Because in the church, we have a reputation that we care more about what's pretty and being on time than we do about the needs of people. And I don't say that to disparage you as a church family, but I say that as a warning, because if you already have that reputation, we as a church have to fight against that and make sure that people know that we see the needs that people have as more important than the beautiful gate and more important than being on time for temple. It's important. Sometimes it means that you have to get down in the nitty-gritty with people. And sometimes it means getting your hands dirty. And sometimes it means the times get hard. And Peter and John were about to find that out. In verse 11, while, we, while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we had made him walk by our own power or godliness? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied before Pilate. Though he had decided to release him, you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer released to you. You killed the source of life, whom God raised from the dead. You are wit we are witnesses of this. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. You see, Peter and John, they had gotten down in the dirt with the lame man, and now he won't let go. He's holding on to them, and a crowd has gathered. And Peter wants to make a few things clear. First, he says, this is not from our own power. And second, it's not our godliness that has made this man walk. First, he says, he's not doing it because of his own power. He's not a sorcerer. He's not a magician. Certainly, there were people going around making a living off of people with this kind of thing. There were all kinds of people in their community taking advantage with parlor tricks and false healings. It's not something we would experience in our day and age, but they did. Right? You can turn on all kinds of TV today where people are going to tell you that this person is healed and therefore you should send money to the person who did the healing. Right? 
While I lived overseas, I saw lots of people take advantage of Ugandans by coming into Uganda with huge tents and telling them there was a healing service coming because this person had come, and they had the gift of healing, and they were there to heal the Ugandans if they had enough faith. I believe that our God heals. I question if he can do it Tuesday at 7 o'clock, but... I also would never tell a Ugandan that they don't have enough faith. Because you know what they have faith? They have faith that they're going to have food tomorrow. They have faith that they're going to get water tomorrow. You and I don't have that kind of faith. Because we know that if we turn on the tap, more water will come out. And if it doesn't, we have a high speed come apart. Right? But then the second thing he says is it's not because of their godliness. There was this misconception that Peter and John were more godly or more holy, and that's why they could perform these miracles. But Peter is putting that idea to rest right here. He says it has nothing to do with their godliness. Peter has, has, is clear here. It has nothing to do with him. It has nothing to do with them. It has everything to do with who? Jesus Christ. It's not about me. It's not about this guy. Peter and John, they were friends for a long time. I imagine Peter was like, it's not this guy for sure. It's not me and it's not him. I know us, right? But it's about Jesus. But these are ideas that we struggle with even today. The idea of magic and magicians and powers and things like that. And the idea that someone is more holy and therefore they can do miracles. Peter's putting all of that to rest right here. The people want to make much. Brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. In this way, God fulfilled what he had predicted through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must receive him until the time of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about through his holy prophets from the beginning. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and from among your brothers you must listen to everything he tells you and everyone who does not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people here again we see that peter as he continues is giving the people what they need instead of what they want they want another miracle right That's why they came. You did that miracle, what else you got? We're here to see. We're here for the show. What they needed was repentance and forgiveness for their sins. What they needed was Jesus. What they wanted was Peter and John. I remember for the last couple of Fourth of Julys, my dad has started this little tradition with our family. What he does is after the 4th of July, he goes and he buys up some of those cheap uh, fireworks when they're like, buy one, get 72 free. You know how that happens. And so you buy, he buys up a bunch of fireworks, and then we go to my mom and dad's house, and um, we get in the pool. They have a pool, and my dad goes out into the field, and he launches off fireworks, and we swim in the pool, and the kids, they cheer, they love it, the kids just think it's the greatest, and the kids are cheering, and my parents are just like smiling because they've made their grandkids grandkids cheer, and I don't know who enjoys it more. It's a great time. But during the fireworks, my niece, my nieces and my, my boys, they start chanting, more, 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 right? And then it kind of gets quiet, and my youngest niece, she yells out, give the people what they want! (laughs) By the people, she meant us. 
and what they want, more fireworks, right? And it was hilarious. We all laughed, give the people what they want. But I thought, that's the society we live in, isn't it? Give the people what they want. Couldn't they have said the same thing to Peter and John on this day? Give the people what they want. But Peter and John are like, we did give you what you wanted. How'd that work out for you? Because you're the same people that wanted Jesus dead. You're the same people who said, let a murderer go free so that we can kill Jesus. Give the people what you want. What you want got our friend killed. What you want got the God of the universe hung on a cross. So often we want what we want, and God wants to give us what we need. And we need to realize that. It's not about what we want. It's about what we need. And this mob mentality has led to that. But now is the time, and what Peter says to them, what you need is repentance. To turn from your sin and yourself and turn back to God. A lot of people say our society today hates God. Our society really has no problem with God. I see people, they accept awards and they say thank you to God. They win a football game and they say thank you to God. No one is offended by that. Right? People can say things about our God, their God, any God you want. Coexist. People are not offended by God. People are, however, offended by the idea of repentance. Because repentance means admitting that what I have done is wrong in the sight of a holy God. And that I have to turn away from it. Turn away from my sin, turn away from myself, and turn to God. Are we willing to repent of what we've done and turn away from our sin? Now that is what's offensive to our society. Because our society doesn't want to admit that what they're doing is wrong. What they're doing is sinful. If you want to talk about something that offends people today, talk about repentance. Because that's what offends people. But think about this crowd that was standing before Peter. What he's asking them to repent of is asking for the death of Christ. For them, it means admitting that they were wrong, that Jesus was who he said he was. Because what did they kill Jesus for? For saying that he was God. And if they admit that they made the wrong choice, they're admitting they were wrong and that Jesus was God and that they were responsible for the death of the Messiah. And if Peter can stand before those people on that day and call for them to repent, then how can we stand here today and say that we don't need to repent? Each and every one of us sins, and God calls on us to repent of those sins. And so we say, we want to see a miracle. Well, today we have an opportunity to see a miracle. We have the opportunity to see a miracle when we see someone who has never repented of their sins repent of their sins and be forgiven. The fact that today someone here with us could say, you know, I've been living my life for myself, but I want to live my life for Christ. And that Christ would offer that forgiveness, that their sins would be forgiven, and they would be made new, is just as much a miracle as a lame man having legs that suddenly worked and leaping and praising the Lord. We think that we don't see miracles today, but miracles occur when we open our eyes and we see the forgiveness of Christ all around us. So today we're going to have a time of invitation. 
the invitation is clear. I invite you to repentance. Repentance for sins, repentance for neglect, repentance in a time of turning away from our sin and ourself and turning to God. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that as we enter into this time of invitation, that you would lead us in a spirit of repentance. That we would turn from whatever is distracting us, whatever we're worshiping, that we would turn from our sin, turn from ourself, and turn back to you. Turn to your son and ask for forgiveness. Lord, the call for repentance is easy, but the act of repentance is hard. Allow us to lay before you whatever distracts, whatever ensnares, and whatever is keeping us from you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you want to grab someone next to you, as we sing this song, you can pray together. I'll be over here. If you'd like to come and pray with me, now is the time. Please stand.